In Acts chapter 12, in our continuation of the study of the book of Acts, this is going to be a key, of course every chapter seems to be a key chapter, but we're going to see a major, major, an end of one major dispensation, which introduces next week, Acts 13, which is the beginning of another major dispensational change. So, today we're going to pretty much say goodbye to Peter, and the twelve, and next week when when it will be the first time that Paul in your Bible that Paul preaches to a group, and it'll be the beginning of the building of the church, which is the body of Christ. You know, Paul's already saved; he got saved in Acts nine. He's the first one to be saved into the church, which is the body of Christ. Anyway, let's just get started here. Acts chapter twelve, verse one. And for our guests this morning, welcome. What we do in the first hour, we've been doing a study straight through the book of Acts. I thought you did football. <laughs> and right after we do that religion, we then start our second study with the book of Acts, now that it's football season. Um, and oh man, I'm not going to hear the end of this one. I can tell right now, George. Acts chapter 12, verse 1. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it please the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. Okay, so we see right out of the shoot here, um, you know, James is killed, and Herod's, whoa, okay, that was pretty good. Uh, you know, sounds like politicians, right? Let me either take an action or talk about taking an action. I'll kind of listen to the pulse of the the people out there, or which way the wind's blowing today, and make a decision on what to do next based on that. And same with Herod here. Verse 3, because he saw it please the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Anyway, so verse 4, and when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him. Do you think he was serious about keeping Peter... Um, locked up. Let's say locked up, bound in prison, in good hands, if you will. The quaternions. Now, each quaternion is four, and he delivered them to four of those. That's 16 soldiers. 16. And we're talking Roman elite. The top of the top soldiers here. Good morning, good morning. We're in Acts uh, chapter 12. Oh, yeah. Okay, uh, four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter, and there's the word Easter in your King James Bible. Wow, how about that? A good and proper word. Yeah. After Easter to bring him forth to the people. So it is already in place. All right, Easter was in place before the crucifixion. Easter is not the celebration of the resurrection. I mean, some people will do that today, but it was something prior to the crucifixion of Christ. All right, it was already in existence when Christ hung on that cross. Think wow. about that next time you think about the bunny, the Easter bunny, and uh, you know people that do celebrate that as the uh, as the resurrection of Christ. It was already in existence. Verse 5. Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. There's that prayer and without ceasing. And we hear Paul talk about pray without ceasing. Maybe we can learn um, even back here. Uh, verse 6. And when Herod would have brought him forth... The same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. Now, by the way, let's even stop right here. Um, the quaternions of soldiers, the elite of the elite soldiers here to keep them. Two are sleeping side by side of him. There's a couple right there at the door, and these soldiers know they mess up. It's death to them. It's off with their heads, if you will. They know that. And it's only one guy, it's just Peter. And yet, you know, we'll watch this story unfold, yes sir. Or 
Did they have knowledge of Peter getting out of prison before? Yeah. Yes, and that's one of the reasons. Yeah, so the question for the camera, did they have knowledge of Peter getting out of prison before? And yes, and hence the reason for making sure, not just making sure, but making sure the imprisonment of Peter because they knew the first time he got out, he was let out. And here we are, we're going to see the same thing happen here. So these, these soldiers know it's, it's death to them if... Uh, <coughs> If Peter is to get out. Verse 7, And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out and followed him, and watch the next phrase about Peter here. And wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought, but thought, he saw a vision. Okay, Peter doesn't really think this is going on. This is just a vision I'm having or something. A dream. A dream, there you go. And when they were uh, past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth into the city, unto the city which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. Okay, so the angel gets him out of prison, and once he's out, the angel leaves. Verse 11, And, Peter was come, and when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent this angel, and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod, and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, John Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken, named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, not saw him, when she heard, you know, Peter at the door, heard his voice, when she knew Peter's voice, it says, uh, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, It is his angel, figuring he's already dead, right? They knew that uh, James was just killed back there in verse 2. Herod had basically said, I'm... Um, Taking Peter, I'm going after Peter, the twelve. Here, you know, here it comes. Uh, so, the end of verse 15. Then said they, It is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. There's that word astonished. You know, it's amazing in just our last couple studies here how often we keep seeing this word astonished. Verse 17, But he, beckoning unto them with the hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, Go show these things unto... Who's he supposed to show them unto? James. James. Go show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. Now, as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers what was become of Peter, and the and story's going to go on and on. Now, verse 17 is actually the key verse of this chapter. And here it is, it looks like just a... Boy, Mike, you missed all the first religion uh, class, and, and of course you can imagine the discussions we had there. We wanted to have you play your ringtone. But verse 17 is going to be the key verse here. So many things happen in this one verse when you have the rest of the Bible and you know when you know the end of the picture and you go back and read that one little segment. I mean, how many times have you gone to a movie, you know, in a one and a half hour, two hour movie, and then after you watch the movie, it's like, oh, now I remember that 10 second or that 30 second little clip back there, why they said this or why they did that or why that was so important. But you didn't know it at the time. But when you see the whole movie, the whole picture, the end of the picture, the rest of the story, it's like, wow, that makes sense now. I couldn't figure out why. Okay? So, verse 17, a couple of things here. 
So let's start in 16. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. So once again, Jews require a sign. They had to see him. Jews always had to see. They just, just something about the Jews. That's why the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 1, for the Jews require a sign. Okay? Uh, verse 17, but he, so Peter, beckoning unto them with the hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. So he tells them the whole story. And he said, Go show these things unto James. Now, we know the rest of the story. We're going to see what unfolds in Acts 14, 15, 16, on through 20, on through 28. One of the things we're going to see is James now becomes the preeminent of the apostles, of the twelve. It's always been Peter unto this time. You know, back in Matthew, it was Peter that the Lord said, Unto thee I will give the king the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou, Peter, shalt bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth, shall be loosed in heaven. Peter was the man. I mean, even the Catholics today call him the first pope, right? But yet right here, Peter is losing... It. The authority shifts from Peter to James, and in Acts 15, we'll really see that. Okay, so we're not going to see any more of that today in Acts 12, but remember that uh, after, it will probably take two weeks in Acts 13, then Acts 14, when we study Acts 15, you know, we're really going to see James as the one that stands up and gives the decrees... Um, when Paul and Barnabas go to see Peter in the twelve. Okay, so anyway, so first of all, it's going to the the authority is going to trans start transitioning to James here. So he said, and he said in the middle of seventeen, go show these things unto James and to the brethren. So James and the brethren were not there. These people were supposed to go tell them. Then it says, and he departed and went into another place. Now it seems like a pretty harmless sentence. Peter departed and went into another place. And I'm going to add some words here, basically, and never to be seen again in your Bible. That's it. We'll see Peter one more time. It's in Acts 15. That's when Paul and Barnabas go to Jerusalem, to the council, to basically work this out, if you will, with Peter and the Twelve, that A... And, and as Paul, well, again, I'm, I'm kind of getting into the Acts 15 study. But Paul says, you know, lest I was in error, you know, he goes, they, they have their discussion. But A, Peter and the Twelve are to go to the Jews while, while Paul is to go to the Gentiles. And B, Peter is to take the gospel as, as Galatians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8 says the gospel of the circumcision to the Jews, while Paul is to take the gospel of... You know, we need to see it. I always see it in Scripture. Hold your hand here. Come over to Galatians chapter 2. So Galatians chapter 2 will be Paul's accounting of what Acts 15 is. Okay, when Paul and Barnabas go to the council in Jerusalem to meet with Peter and the twelve. Acts 15 is going to be Luke's accounting of it. Galatians 2 is Paul looking back at it. Alright, so actually Acts chapter 2 verse 1. Then, So this is Paul talking. Then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. And here's the phrase, but privately to them which were of reputation, the apostles, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. Okay, so there's that part about basically just you know doing a, a check here to make sure that I had not run in vain. Now come down to verse... Um, 7. But contrarywise, when they, the council in Jerusalem in Acts 15, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. 
Okay? You see two different Gospels there. Gospel of the circumcision. Gospel of the uncircumcision. Now, if you have any other Bible other than the King James Version, your Bible will not say that. Your Bible will say Gospel to the circumcision and Gospel to the uncircumcision was committed unto me, Paul. It's just a two-letter word that totally changes the entire meaning of the verse. There are two Gospels. We may even see that in the second hour, a verse or two, that if you're in a different version other than King James, it's not even listed. We had a number... Uh, uh, one of our guys here, uh, Samuel, comes to the Wednesday morning Bible study. And uh, we have one guy, everybody uses King James in there now. And one guy brings an NIV, so we had it sitting there. And we had him, see, this would be a good one for you to read out of NIV. And he went there and, and hold your hand here, <laughs> or put a marker there. Go to Mark chapter 9. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. If you could have seen this young man's face. Young man. Yeah, young man. Younger than me. He's about two years younger than I am. That's right. Mark 2? Uh, Mark 9. To my knowledge, the only place in the Bible where a verse is listed three times. I know of a couple places where a verse is used two times, sometimes in a row, but here it's used three different times. And if you're in the King James Bible, that is, because other versions don't. As a matter of fact. So, verse 43, Mark 9, 43. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched, and their worm die where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. For it is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thine eye offend thee, Pluck it out, for it is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Everybody see that? 44, 46, 48? I mean verbatim. You think it's important if he's saying it three different times. And please, if anybody knows of any other verse that's used three times, Please let me know, because I keep making that statement. This is like the fourth study now in the last two weeks that I've gone there, made that statement. Nobody's given me that yet. I'm going to say there's some pretty good Bible students. So if you know of one, let me know, because A, I don't want to be making false statements, but B, it also emphasizes the importance of this. Now, why are you making a big deal, Steve? I had this guy, so after we've done it, I said, hey, by the way, I, I knew, by the way, Jeff, would you get that other not inspired version, as we call the NIV, the you know the not inspired version, and go read that passage. And uh, if you could have watched him, boy, I wish I had this on video. It almost get a ten thousand dollar award for America's funniest home videos. So he opens up in the not inspired version. So would you read for, verse forty four, please? And I want to see how they word it. That's how I said it to him. And, he, and he's looking. He says, give me just a minute. The print's smaller in this Bible. So he gets his glasses out. Puts his glasses on. And he's looking. He says, well, tell you what. Let me start in verse 43. I'm, I'm just not seeing it. So let me start. In, and he reads 43. And then he gets to 45. And he goes, it's not there. And everybody, and the other guys, you know, they're all, I'll say, new Bible students. And they're like, what? Well, let me see it. And, and the other guy grabs the Bible. And, and he looks, and he's like, it's not there. And the other guys are like, what are you talking about? And he said, it's not there. Gang, there is. And here's the, the other thing. They know they're leaving it out because they have 43, 
The next verse is 45. And oh, by the way, the next verse after 45 is 47. They left it out in verse 44. They left it out in verse 46. They left a place for it, but it's not in those versions of the Bible. Those perversions of the Bible. Why in the world would they leave a verse out that says, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched, in reference to hell? Because... It is a loving God who would send anybody yeah. to hell. Right? Yeah. yeah, exactly. And for the camera, the comment made back here, because it is a loving God who wouldn't send anybody to hell. Uh, is it also potentially because preceding all of those verses, you have the statement, uh, into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, and then it goes into the worm diet not before each one of those? So it, and it does say that at the end of 43, into the uh, having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. I mean, he's making a point about that fire not being quenched. It is people trying to. Why are the are these? Now settle down. Why are there so many perversions of the Word of God? By the way, most of them didn't start to the late 1800s. Early 1900s is when they were made. About the time the printing press really got rolling. About the time you could really start making some money if you had a new version of the Bible. And oh, by the way, what if we start trying to change... You know, my doctrine in my head, says this group, is He's a loving God and He wouldn't throw people into hell. And therefore, hell's too much in the Bible. So, matter of fact, we'll even take the word hell out of it. How many perversions of the word to, of the Bible today don't even have the word hell anywhere from Genesis to Revelation. They take it out. They take the, the they take hell out of the Bible because it doesn't match their doctrine. I've got to rewrite a Bible to match the doctrine I've got in my head, says group ABC. And that's exactly what's going on. They totally miss the fact God Loves us so much He wouldn't throw us into hell? Yeah! That's why He made provision 2,000 years ago. That's why on that cross He sent His Son. He didn't just send somebody. He sent His own Son. His only begotten Son is what the Bible calls Him. Let Him die on that cross and to shed His blood to pay the penalty for our sins. Took our sins to that place called hell that is a real place. And He did go there and left our sins in hell, and on the third day, God the Father raised Him for our justification. That's how much He loved us. He had to turn His back on His old son. On His own son, excuse me. Friday night, you know, I was telling, sharing the story with that group about Barry Hampton's nine-year-old son that was killed in that car accident, and 30 days later, Barry Hampton standing up at a Bible conference with hundreds of people. I, we couldn't even believe he was there let alone get up and preach. And he gave a talk every one of you has got to, to hear. It's called Cost of the Father. I would think if you just Googled that on the internet even. Hampton, Cost of the Father. And he's, and they, you know, I'm summing up a whole lot of stuff here. But he says, I have such a better appreciation for what God the Father went through at the crucifixion having buried my son three weeks ago for what it was I mean it was less than a month from when his son was two hundred yards away from the car when they got you know terrible accident. How does he end up two hundred feet from the car you might think about. It was he said, Steve, the only way I knew it was my son was by the red shoes he had, red sneakers he had on his feet. Horrendous accident. Another person was killed in that accident. And Barry was in the car. My point is what God the Father went through. And Barry, there wasn't a dry eye in there. He said, I, I, I have such a much better appreciation for what God the Father went through when He had to turn His back on His Son because He could not, God could not look on sin. And 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says, He made Him to be sin for us. He who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Praise the Lord for that. That's how much He loved us. So anybody that says there's no hell, you know, how could a loving God th 
throw people into hell. Well, He doesn't throw people into hell. He gave His only Son to make provision for us so that we didn't have to go to hell. That's love. Hey, you know, how many men would give their lives for some other man, right? The Bible even talks about that. That's how much He loved us. It's people that reject it. It's people that hear the love of the truth, that hear the Gospel of Christ. Once you've heard it, you now are forced to make a decision because either you accept the free gift of eternal life through believing in the Gospel and trusting in that and that alone for your salvation, and if you do not accept if you do not receive that, then by default you are rejecting that. Either receive it or reject it. There's no sitting the fence. And if you don't receive it, you do reject it. Now, the good news is you get a second, third, and fourth, and fifth, and twenty-eighth chance in this dispensation where you didn't in Acts chapter 2. You didn't receive it, you reject it, boom. You get no second chance back there. We live in the dispensation of the grace of God, praise the Lord. But, 2 Thessalonians 2 says, when it says in reference to them that perish, why do they perish? Because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. They rejected it. They received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. That's why they go to hell. God made it so easy for us. So yes, He is a very loving God. How could He be any more loving than to give His Son for us? My point of going to Mark 9 was really not to talk about hell that much as it was to just show an example of where other versions leave. We went to the the guy I was driving with. He goes to a, a certain church in Austin there and they use the ESV, the English Standard Version. And he said, go to ESV. And I had, fortunately, that's one you can get on eSword. So I had it in my phone there, the ESV, and look, sure enough, it's out of that one too. And he was just devastated that it was not in the ESV. So um, why do they leave it out? Not once, but twice, gang. Now, we got there because we were talking about the change in Galatians chapter 2, verse 7, and we don't even need to go back there, but they changed gospel of the circumcision to gospel to the circumcision. Once again... There are too many of the 320 some denominations today that don't like the fact they want it to be the same gospel, not just in the New Testament, not just Peter and Paul preaching the same gospel. They want the same gospel throughout the whole Bible. So they rewrite Bibles to, to make the Bible say to match their doctrine rather than their doctrine say match you know, what comes out of the Bible, out of your King James Bible. So they just rewrite them. They're changing doctrine. Now, are they necessarily doing it intentionally? You know, somebody is. But like the the phrase used, like sheep led to the slaughter. So many people are just ignorant of it because they don't study the Bible. That's why we've got to study. That's why you should never take my word for anything. You should never take any man's word standing up here teaching you until you see it in the Scriptures for yourself. You need to be like those Bereans in Acts chapter 17. The Bible said calls them more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they search the Word daily, search the Scriptures daily, whether those things were so. And then verse 12, the first phrase, therefore many of them believe. Don't believe it until you see it in this Bible. I'm going to emphasize King James Bible. Okay? But once you see it in here, and you've heard it taught, you've heard it explained, you understand it, you see it in Scripture, yep, okay. So I encourage you as a family to keep your own statement of faith as a family. And put the verses there. Okay, put the verses there with it. Okay, back to Acts uh, chapter 12. So we see that there were two Gospels there. The Gospel of, from, and again, Galatians 2 was telling us the Gospel of the circumcision was committed unto Peter as the Gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto Paul. Okay, there's two, two Gospels and this, Acts 12, is where Peter goes away. As it says at the end of verse 17, and he departed and went into another place. 
we know the end of the... You know, we've got the whole Bible. We know how this thing's going to unfold for the next 30 or 40 years after this. We look back on this and say, wow, just an easy statement, and he went into another place. But he's out of the picture for the rest of the Bible. Paul, and in the dispensation of grace, is just getting started here. And of course, that's what we're going to be learning as we get past Acts 15, well, next week in Acts 13, and then especially after we get past Acts 15. All right, let's continue Acts 12 now. Actually, before we leave 17. So, Peter, we're not going to see him physically, but obviously Peter continues his ministry past this. The Bible is just not going to show us that because the transition of Paul and the rest of the book of Acts is going to unfold everything that happens there. It's the diminishing of the Jews, right? The diminishing of Israel that's going to continue. Let's put our timeline up here. So I'm just going to make... Actually, I'm going to start at the birth of Christ. I'm going to make that the crucifixion. So we have a lot of room for the book of Acts. That's Acts 28, beginning of the dispensation of the grace of God. Now back here at Acts 9 is where the body of Christ, the church which is the body of Christ, starts. And of course, the, the next prophesied event in time, even though this was two, almost 2,000 years ago, will be what is called the rapture of the church. I'll never forget, there's probably 15-ish years ago when Ann and I were having reason to talk on the phone a, a fair amount. And I'll never forget the times I'd call her house and I, and I wouldn't get her, but I'd hear her answering machine. And I don't remember the beginning part, but, you know, hey, this is Ann, leave your message, but, you know, and, and if I'm not here, you know, either I'm here, there, or I'll, I'll see you later, but here, there, or in the air. And um, something to that effect. Do you have a better, how that went? I don't way? have a house phone anymore. Yeah, nobody oh, does, I right? I my cell phone. <laughs> but I, I remember so distinctly uh, the first time I heard that when I called in, she said, you know, hey, if not, I'll see you here, there, or in the air. And of course, in reference to the, the next prophesied event, the rapture of the church, the calling out of the body of Christ, then begins the seven-year period of great tribulation, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to earth to set up His thousand-year reign. And even when I start with the birth here, I still end up with little room over there. I'll... Anyway. <laughs> okay. My point of putting this on here... Peter continues, so we're in Acts 12. There's 28 chapters in Acts. But remember, back here, you know, uh, Peter and the Twelve start a church, you know, the Kingdom Church, right? And, you know, the Church of God at Jerusalem. But in the book of Acts, what we have is a, a falling away of this church, and from Acts 9 on, we have the building up of the church which is the body of Christ, so that when we get to the end of the book of Acts, this ceases. That's a hard stop. We're the only church from this point forward is the church which is the body of Christ. And as we will see in the second hour, Paul says in 1 Timothy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern for them which should hereafter believe. Paul was, he was saved in Acts 9. He was the first one to go into the body of Christ. And that's where every one of us today, the moment of our salvation, we become a, a member, if you will, of the church which is the body of Christ. Okay? So again, we know the whole picture, So that, and we know that this is happening. I don't believe, and it doesn't matter, maybe he did, maybe he didn't. I don't believe Peter knew that that church was going away at that time. What Peter did know, and we're going to look at a passage here, is that Peter thought he was going right into this. Remember Acts chapter 1 when we did our study? One of the first questions that the 11 at that time, they hadn't even replaced 
Judas yet. The eleven are standing there with the Lord Jesus Christ before He ascended into heaven. Lord, wilt Thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? They think that's coming. That's why Acts chapter 2, 3, 4, 5, remember they're selling out, having all things common. That's why they think they're in the, the trip starting. They know that the Lord won't return until seven year period of great tribulation. Remember we studied all that? Okay? So they thought that was happening. We're now to Acts 12. When Peter reads, reads uh, writes what we're going to read here, Peter knows that he probably is going to die before that happens. Peter no longer has an expectation of himself being part of the seven-year trip. And we're first going to... Obviously, we'll be coming back to Acts 12, but we're going to go to 1 Peter and we're going to go to 2 Peter. So 1 Peter chapter 3. Tell you what, in the name of time, let's just, let's just go to the Second Peter passage. Second Peter chapter one, almost Revelation. Second Peter 